When I was growing up, I was afraid of a lot of things. I wouldn't call it a specific fear, more just that I was extra sensitive to potentially scary imagery in situations. Obviously, a lot of kids have a lower fear threshold, but mine was lower than most. My parents had pretty strict rulings on most forms of entertainment when I was younger. I wasn't allowed to play games with any kind of real violence until I graduated middle school. I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated movies until a similar time, same for the TV show equivalents. I wasn't allowed to use websites like Tumblr or YouTube to find personalized and or edgy content. Even my music app on my iPod had a restriction that wouldn't allow me to hear explicit songs. Point is, I wasn't exposed to a lot of ideas when I was younger. This had two results. First is that I was a really weird kid. Because I couldn't be on social media or YouTube, I was never caught up with the memes or the slang of the times. And as a fairly socially anxious person, I hated having conversations with kids who were allowed to have more fun, because I had no frame of reference for what they were saying. Kids, at least in my experience, are incredibly referential creatures. If you haven't seen the thing they're talking about, the conversation dies in the water. It always felt like that terrible situation where you're in a room that's way too loud and someone asks you to something and you can't hear them, but for some reason you've decided you don't want to make them repeat themselves, so you just go, haha, yeah, and sprint off in the other direction. The second result, really the foundation of this essay, is that I had no stomach for visual horror, despite an ironic fascination with the subject. It was a nasty relationship. During the light of day, I could handle a lot. What few scary shows I was allowed to watch, I ate up. Goosebumps and The Haunting Hour were some of my favorites. I destroyed horror books like it was nothing, whatever I could get my hands on. Edgar Allan Poe, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Stephen King, even crummy horror movie tie-ins. I specifically remember this one Friday the 13th book that took place in an amusement park. A wax figure of Jason comes to life for some reason and kills everyone. Classic slasher antics, probably not that well written in retrospect, but I had never seen a slasher movie. I couldn't sleep for days after reading that one, which was always the case. The night made everything which had seemed fun and exhilarating in the light of day terrifying and oppressive. I had not struck a healthy balance yet. The reason I mentioned my initial weakness to horror is that now, if you've watched my content or spoken to me before, you'll probably know, I'm a huge fan of horror, including horror movies, so clearly there was a transitionary period where I had to suffer through an intense fear in an attempt to enjoy horror in its most popular form. I feel like most people have to make this plunge. There's a video topic I've seen tons of YouTubers cover individually, personalized explanations of childhood traumas. It's always interesting, because as a great deal of the creators I watch are horror fans to some degree, the difference between what scared them when they were young and what scares them today couldn't be more different. It seemed fairly rare for someone to be born a fan of horror, just due to the confrontational nature of the genre. It was during this transitional period when I found myself falling into a specific ideology, a huge distaste for jump scares. Admittedly, back in the day, the reasoning was that I simply didn't have the stomach for them. I fell for the horror setup, hook, line, and sinker every time. Put me in a silent ass obscured room covered in darkness and cobwebs, draw my attention in towards one detail of the scene, bait and switch me with a fake jump scare, then throw a ghost or something at me and I'm down for the count. Or at least I would have been. Though to hear me tell it back then, it was just a matter of taste. It was lazy, I would say. It's more surprising than it is scary. But I knew the truth. Except. As I started growing out of my childhood fears, and my young fascination with horror solidified into a genuine passion for it, and I started building up a tolerance to the tropes, the false reasoning I had given for my dislike of jump scares became kind of true. In my old age, I can recognize that it's reductive to say that all jump scares are lazy. Sometimes you're making a movie that's just great for jump scares. I think that jump scares have a great place in horror comedy, or really anything that has more personality than just spookiness. My real issue is with the Blumhouse cash grab no effort jump scares that really only do serve to get reactions. This isn't a super original argument to make, but if you make me jump in a movie theater then you really haven't accomplished anything that impressive. Humans have a natural response to being startled, something we usually attribute to our fight or flight response, and movie theater speakers are loud as hell. You don't even really need a lead up, the scene could be super well lit, it could be a completely innocuous scene, but if you just suddenly cut to a train blowing its horn into a microphone and I jump, that doesn't mean I'm afraid of trains, it means you're an asshole. This was a line of logic I was pretending to run with when I was 12, and the one I've actually been running with for the better part of 8 years now. Jump scares, with some exception, are bad, and I prefer horror that relies on other things to induce fear. The issue is, if you know anything about the horror movie industry as it exists today, you know that that's a hard baseline to work with. So many pieces of horror, not just movies, but games and TV as well, are loud as hell. I'm tired of in-your-face horror. I'm tired of screaming and splatters of blood and chainsaw noises and aggressive-ass violin stings and bangs and gunshots. I'm tired of horror where I feel like I'm being assaulted. I miss- Picture this. It's night. Maybe you live with other people. Maybe you live alone. But either way, you're the only person awake.
It doesn't matter why you're awake. Maybe you had a bunch of caffeine before turning in. Maybe you stayed up playing video games and got wired by the blue light. Maybe you're an insomniac. Whatever the case, you're up. The screens are off. The music is off. The people are off. And you're up. Continue picturing this scene from your perspective as you walk to the window. I live on the fifth floor in my apartment complex, but maybe you're higher than that. Maybe you're lower. Either way, imagine looking out that window towards the familiar streetlight, the one that you've grown so used to seeing out that window during the day, and seeing a figure beneath its glow. The figure is holding completely still, shrouded by the night, so you're not sure what they're doing or where they're looking. You glance at the clock. 3 a.m. No one should be up at 3 a.m. When you look back at the streetlight, the figure is still there. Keep imagining the scene, staring out that window at that unmoving form. How long would you sit there? Maybe you'd go back to bed, but I know if I did, I'd be too anxious to sleep, too curious. What if you went and checked again and the figure was still there? What if it wasn't? Maybe instead of trying to sleep, you'd be so bold as to go and check in on the person beneath the light. It is a cold season, and maybe they're just a late-night drinker, too intoxicated to realize they're not going anywhere. And what if, during this process of deciding what to do next, the figure looked at you? No violin sting, no crash, barely any perceptible movement at all other than the one humans are so good at noticing. A shift of the shoulders, a twist of the neck, a straight-on perspective. If you're telling me you don't believe you'd feel a spike of panic in your heart, a drop of nausea in your gut, then you're a crazy person. This is the kind of horror that works for me. People like to come up with names for this style of scares. Psychological horror, lo-fi horror, or my personal favorite, quiet horror. But it all means mostly the same thing. The trading in of bombast and terror for subtlety and uncertainty. Sacrificing screams for whispers and gore for the sounds of a house settling. Ironically though, I've put so much weight on the actual quality of sound, this concept is not applied only to movies, television, and radio. Written fiction can be loud or quiet too, it's the difference between reading M.R. James and Clive Barker. One of them will give you a subtle story about the nature of spirits, strange retellings which urge you to consider the truth of death in the afterlife, and the other one will give you Hellraiser. Neither one of these authors are worse than the other one, and in fact, I enjoy both of their works to a pretty high degree, but the intensity of their stories are hugely different. Is this because they were born 90 years apart? Probably to a degree, but M.R. James was born first, in 1862. 1862, I don't know if you know this, happened a long time ago. Over 10 years ago, in fact. When M.R. James was in his prime, McDonald's was still a good 40 years from opening, the internet a solid 80 years out, and Blumhouse still had a century's wait to endure before it started pumping out shitty movies. I mention this only because when I tell you that M.R. James' work is still some of the best short horror available today, it might be hard to believe. How could someone writing from a perspective in times so far removed from our own be compelling and frightening, especially against the modern precedent set by the in-your-face horror which began to pick up in the 60s and 70s as the exploitation film boom morphed into the modern slasher, heralded by relaxed censorship guidelines in America? Well, quite simply, it's because a good ghost story is timeless. Sure, we all love the concept of the ghost in the machine these days, an idea which has morphed from being about the consciousness and its separation from the body and has become attached to non-biological possession. Internet and TV ghosts, our modern takes on hauntings, our black mirrors and videodromes. These concepts are evidently successful and yet they do not erase our fascination with antiquarian hauntings. For every pulse, there is a contrasting conjuring. We're not so satisfied by horror in modern settings that we completely ignore more traditional horror stories, what one might describe as gothic or potentially Victorian inspired. But there's another thing which allows M.R. James's work to stand the test of time. Namely, the format in which most of his stories are written. In preparation for this essay, I reread two stories. A school story, the first I read of his work, and Oh Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, a story with a mouthful of a title that is regarded as his most unsettling work. Both of them are great and follow a similar format. We're introduced to a couple of characters talking about their lives, and somehow things get around to the topic of the supernatural. There's a character who doesn't believe in ghosts, and then you get a ghost story. The thing is, though, they aren't just ghost stories. They are stories that characters are telling about ghosts, complete with their own reactions and thoughts. A school story is told primarily through a dialogue between two friends about an experience at their own school, and the narrator of O Whistle refers to himself in the first person and references his own experiences alongside that of the protagonists, which draws the reader into giving weight to whatever experience they might have had in reference to the scene before them. And at the end, there's not really a moral, because what experience in real life has such a distinct moral? It feels odd to say, but and then everything went back to normal is not an uncommon ending to real life events. 
Still though, it has an almost cosmic quality, and that even though things are normal now, we really don't know why the weird thing happened or if it'll happen again. Ironically, my fascination with M.R. James was spawned by another horror endeavor which deserves mention in this essay. Not a movie or show, not a book or even a YouTube video, a medium which I intend to discuss in a moment, but a podcast produced by Jonathan Sims for the Rusty Quill Podcast Network, The Magnus Archives. The Magnus Archives is a 200-part horror tragedy series which started being produced in 2016 and ended officially in 2021, though a sequel or spin-off or whatever is quickly approaching. It was a sort of anthology horror that developed into a longer and more complicated story about the members of the Magnus Institute's archival team, complete with plenty of gay romance and a lot of terrible things happening to people you've grown to like. There's a big part of me that would like to write a full video about the Magnus Archives, so if you're interested in that, let me know, but let's not get carried away. How is the Magnus Archives related to M.R. James? Well, for one thing, Jonathan Sims cites M.R. James as one of his biggest inspirations in his writing, and knowing this, the similarities become immediately apparent. First, the title of the whole damn thing is a reference to another very popular M.R. James story, Count Magnus, but beyond superficial references to horror authors and characters, a naming convention Sim falls into a lot in Magnus Archives. I'm looking at you, Tim Stoker, Michael Shelley, and Melanie King. The actual style of writing in Magnus Archives harkens back to a uniquely personal style which M.R. James used in his most popular horror stories. Magnus Archives is famous for its statement begins style of horror, each story being a first-hand account of some terrible terror which the narrator experienced. This perspective on horror, notably horror which has already occurred and is being reacted to after the fact, is hugely reminiscent of the personal, semi-casual tone of explanation that the narrators of James's work tended to fall into. The interesting thing about the audio medium of horror is that it requires much more thought to be done effectively than even written horror. Quality writing is still necessary in the same way it would be for a book or movie, but unlike a book, there still has to be attention given to sound quality, music, atmosphere, convincing narration and dialogue, and unlike a movie, these focuses cannot rely on a visual canon to be terrifying. Approaching these circumstances, it seems like there are two big ways to attempt to be scary. Loud, intense scenes which panic the listener, or slow, subtle scenes which get under the listener's skin. Magnus Archives utilizes both at times, but for the most part falls into the latter category. The very first episode you'll listen to, Anglerfish, illustrates this perfectly. The narrator recounts the story to our protagonist of a strange encounter he had while drunkenly walking home from a celebration. After taking a tumble and calming himself with a cigarette, he is called to from a dark alley. A silhouette, mostly obscured in shadow, asks for a cigarette. The narrator holds one out, attempting to draw the figure into the light, but it doesn't move. At this point, an icy dread begins to settle over the speaker. He recounts to our protagonist that something seemed off about the figure, its stillness and refusal to move from the alley, the tone of its voice. Something seems wrong. The silhouette's feet don't appear to be touching the ground. It doesn't move when it speaks. Something is wrong. The narrator attempts to pull out his phone and take a picture of the silhouette, and with that action, the silhouette folds in and is sucked away, as if pulled back by a string from the stomach, and and that's pretty much it. The, the protagonist provides some supplemental information, implying that there have been a number of disappearances in the area mentioned, all smokers, but then the case is simply brushed off. Now, why is this episode so effective? Out of 200 distinct episodes, the very first one still strikes me as one of the most horrifying, even though nothing really happens. No one dies, at least not during the story, there are no jumps, and we don't even really get to know what the silhouette was. And yet, as the episode ends, you're left with an eerie feeling, like you've just clued into something you really should have avoided. There's an expectation that begins to grow during tense scenes in horror that something will eventually happen, that the tension you're feeling will eventually reach a breaking point, and the scare will come, releasing all the energy and resetting the tone of the scene until the next moment of horror. But Anglerfish doesn't do this. Instead, it makes you feel more and more uncomfortable, ominous music creeping in as the intensity reaches its high point, the emotion of the speaker becoming more and more fearful as they remember what happened to them, and then the story is done. There's no satisfying reveal, no sigh of relief. We don't know what happened, or why, but we know it was wrong. Quite honestly, the scene would be worse if the silhouette leapt out of the alley and started attacking our narrator. Sure, that's more actively threatening, but is it scarier? After our narrator either gets away or dies, is the falling exhilaration more effective than a lingering dread? I don't think so. The fact of the matter is this. H.P. Lovecraft was kind of right when he said, The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. And that's kind of the only thing he was right about. Truly, nothing which you can be overtly shown will ever be scarier than what you imagine in horror. Some fears are pretty universal. Being murdered, having pain inflicted on us, losing people we care about. 
pretty much every sane individual is uncomfortable with those concepts. But when it gets to the nitty gritty, the little things which set us on edge, the features and sounds which make our hair stand on end, there's a lot of variation. To illustrate this, allow me to give you some insight into my own relationship with horror. I am not afraid of dolls. And further, I'm not afraid of potentially haunted dolls. In fact, I live with two of them. First things first, I don't believe in ghosts. I call Squimbus and Frumbo, those are their names, haunted because they're weird looking and I've created a narrative for them among my friends, but in reality, they're just porcelain, cloth, wire, and paint, all brought together to create something which looks like a human or a baby or what have you. That's what all dolls are. To me, through my own rationale, there's nothing threatening at all about dolls. However, my experience clearly isn't universal. There have been tons of movies which feature haunted or possessed dolls in recent years, with varying levels of success. There's Annabelle, The Boy, Dead Silence, Poltergeist, Megan, Chucky, and a bunch of other ones I'm probably not aware of. Annabelle made $257 million globally. There's clearly a group of people, and a large enough one to count, that find dolls scary. So let's flip things. My absolute number one fear is medical needles. Shocker, coming from someone with so many tattoos, but it's not a pain thing. It's just the idea of something being jabbed into my muscles, or God forbid, my veins. That makes me feel queasy and upset. Truthfully, I experience a much more tangible and gripping horror waiting for a vaccination than I ever have watching a horror movie. And yet 230 million people in America are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, myself included. That's 70% of the country receiving multiple medical injections, likely in a short time frame. What was a terrifying experience for me was a necessary and potentially life-saving procedure for so many other people. According to the CDC, only one in every four adults has a strong fear of needles. That's 25%, so if we falsely assume that every vaccinated person was an adult, that leaves 172.5 million people who have experienced very little trauma getting their vaccine. Even if we take out another 72.5 million to attempt to account for children who experience a fear of needles, the data speaks for itself. America is more afraid of dolls than needles. So let's do another hypothetical. Say I told you that the scariest thing in the world was around this corner. Immediately, an idea pops into your head. It may not be the whole encapsulation of your greatest nightmare, but I'd be willing to bet that you have some idea of what could be waiting for you just around the corner. Now, if I came around the corner and showed you a spider, then realistically, there's a 3 to 15% chance you'd be terrified. That's the assumed percentage of people with arachnophobia globally. If I showed you a doll, especially if it was moving, there's a 9% chance I'd have correctly guessed your fear, if you were an American. But what if I didn't turn the corner? What if I simply told you that the scariest thing in the world was around the corner, and then I left you there? I like to call this idea Schrodinger's terror. Until the camera pans and shows you precisely what my version of the scariest thing in the world is, the only thing you have to go on is your version of what the scariest thing in the world is. Through the simple act of not showing you what I think you'll be afraid of, and rather letting you imagine it for yourself, I've effectively created a situation which is terrifying for everyone, and not just those who happen to fall into the category I'm reaching for. Quiet Horror accomplishes this fairly regularly. It takes the burden of scaring its audience off its own shoulders and places it on those of the individual audience member. What you're afraid of becomes what the story is about, even if the person who created it could never truly know what you are afraid of. So let's talk about Skinamarink. From nearly the first shot, it's clear that Skinamarink is going for something very specific in its horror. The audio design is fuzzy and soft, the visuals are grainy and nostalgic, and the shots are odd, to say the least. Skinamarink goes so far out of its way to leave things to your imagination that it barely shows you anything. Every shot is focused on a part of the environment, this strange house we find ourselves in, and not on the characters who are interacting with it, primarily two young children. The choice to use young children also serves this goal. With adult protagonists, a degree of rationality is expected. The application of logic, the understanding of complex situations, and the discernment of what is normal in a situation and what is a threat are all qualities that we expect from adult characters because that's what we expect from actual adults. Their brains are developed, they've had experiences that educate them on how to react to different situations. But when you make your protagonist a kid, especially one under the age of five, that expectation goes out the window. How in the world could we criticize a toddler for making a strange decision under circumstances which they don't understand? The majority of their life has been made of circumstances they don't understand. And that's where the true horror starts in Skinamarink. Do you remember the first time you were afraid? Honestly, you probably don't. Fear is one of those primal emotions that come built into the human experience, but do you remember the first time you truly understood it? The first time you recognized a reaction in yourself to a specific influence? How old were you? What did you do? When I was really little, I went to the library with my mom to watch a marionette show of The Wizard of Oz. At this point, I don't remember much, it happened so long ago, but I do remember one thing. The witch. 
Every time the witch was about to appear, a song would play. I don't remember the song. In my head, it's some bassy nightmare, but I don't know. What I do know is that when the witch came on stage, I was filled to my core with fear. I asked to leave early, and we did. I actually asked my mom about her memory of this day, and it's interesting, she didn't even recall me being scared. Apparently I didn't cry or yell or cause a scene, I was just very insistent that I didn't like them. It is funny, I promise I don't have a thing about dolls, but maybe I did then? Either way, I was gripped for the first time in my life with a very real fear, and it didn't even show. Kids have a weird way of responding to the world, and it's because they still don't get it, or how it works, or why. Why did that witch freak me out? I don't remember. I don't think I thought it was an actual threat. I've never been afraid of witches. Something about that moment was scary to me specifically in a way that I'll literally never understand. And I think it's because I didn't understand it then, either. In Skinnamarink, fairly early on, all the doors and windows disappear from the house. To you and me, that's a big deal because even if nothing happens after that, that's just not something that happens. It's not that it doesn't happen often, or that it only happens under specific circumstances, it just doesn't happen. And so, if you or I started to panic after realizing all the doors were missing, that would be an understandable reaction. But imagine if it happened when you were four. When you're four, you have zero control over your life, and that's a good thing. The survival instincts of four-year-olds are essentially non-existent. A four-year-old's experience of reality is a constantly shifting landscape of houses, booster seats, grocery stores, churches, states, government buildings, and hospitals. Four-year-olds are moved across the country before they know what a country is, are flown to another state before they can comprehend how an airplane works, see TV and movies without realizing the differences between those stories and reality, and encounter a hundred other insane things on a daily basis while they wait for their brains to develop. If you were four and all the doors and windows disappeared from your house, would you be absolutely certain that that wasn't normal? Sure, it might surprise you, and a lot of children respond to surprises with fear, but would you recognize the physics that made such a transformation impossible? Would you be grounded enough in reality to be sure that such a thing couldn't happen, and that it wasn't just another wild part of being alive you had yet to experience? The little boy, Kevin, in Skinnamarink is four. His sister, Kaylee, is six. They don't panic because they're so young, they don't know to. But here's the final ingredient of what makes everything that follows so much scarier. It's kind of a repetition, but it's what makes Skinnamarink so effective. The kids don't know that something horrible is happening. But we do. There's a kind of surrogate fear that we as the audience take on as we watch Skinnamarink. It's not that the imagery is all that evocative, or that the few jump scares which do exist in the movie are all that shocking. As I've laid out, at least to me, those aren't the things that make a good horror movie scary. What's scary is the fear we have for the children as they respond to increasingly malevolent forces, ignorant to the evil at work. We're trapped and capable of warning the children even though we know better than them, even though anyone would know better than them. When we learn that the parents are still somehow in the house, that isn't a relief to us because why didn't the parents come running as soon as things started going wrong? When Kaylee walks into her mother's room, she thinks she's walking into safety because that's what walking into her mother's room has always meant before now. But we know she's walking into danger because we're aware of how parents are meant to behave around their children. We even get a quick glimpse of what their behavior is normally like towards the beginning of the movie, as the father calls someone to inform them of Kevin's falling. We see him speak with a regular cadence, express concern in a normal enough way, react to negative circumstances, all things which reassure us of his character as a father. The silent, disappearing man in the bedroom is unequivocally not normal. But to Kaylee, that's just her father doing something weird. Her father does a lot of weird things every day, but he would never hurt her, so why would this be any different? This trick, among a few others, is how Skinnamarink gets under your skin, and it's pretty interesting that it does. It's playing on your empathy in the best way possible, quietly. A worse filmmaker with a similar goal might keep a tighter focus on the children, making the events they encounter much more aggressive, focusing on their faces as they experience pain and terror, because doesn't it make sense that the more terrible shit you do to a child, the more horrifying it is for the empathetic viewer? Actually? No. Pop culture actually has a real distaste for gratuitous violence towards children, even in a fictional setting. The concept of a unified system of morality in America is laughable, and yet most people, regardless of political identity or religious beliefs, aren't super into watching children suffer. Think about every shooter you've played with children as NPCs. Nearly 100% of the time, you cannot inflict any kind of damage to those characters. GTA V has a distinct lack of characters under the age of 18, even though it takes place in what is essentially modern Hollywood, because the game knows that a great deal of its appeal is the opportunity to go on a rampage, destroying things and people without any consequences. We're pretty damn sure that video games don't encourage violent tendencies in their players, and yet most games still draw the line at violence towards kids. When a kid does die in fiction, generally horror fiction, it almost always happens off screen, if it's even depicted at all. 
empathy only goes so far before we start questioning the motives of a creator. And so that's why the kids aren't scared for the majority of Skinamarink, not really. If they were scared, they probably wouldn't do half the things they do, experience half the terrifying things they experience. If they didn't, neither would we, and each of those experiences are made more terrifying by the kids' lack of fear. There's a big idea in the movie and television industry that goes, show don't tell. It's pretty self-explanatory as a rule. It will always be more effective to show your audience something rather than having a character explain or describe it to them. In horror though, I think the rule should be taken a step further to imply, don't show. We return to the corner. Over the last couple of years, I and the rest of the internet have gotten really into analog horror. If you're watching this video, I probably don't need to explain what analog horror is, but just in case, analog horror is a style of fiction that uses outdated and nostalgic technology to induce a very particular style of discomfort in its viewer. Things like VHS and cassette tapes, chunky and compressed audio from old school microphones, and the usage or recreation of old school broadcasts like news alerts or public service announcements are all staples for the analog horror genre. Ironically, it actually seems like a format suited more towards millennials and even Gen Xers who would have experienced those things a lot more regularly than I have as a lowly Gen Z kid, though I caught the tail end of their time in America. Somehow, analog horror has taken Gen Z by storm. We're a hugely nostalgic generation, it seems, even for things we weren't there for. There are a variation of reasons that any analog horror movie or series might give to explain why you, the viewer, are seeing it, but typically the explanation implies that the events you're seeing have taken place in the past, and that for some reason they're being archived or showcased online. There's often a third party involved somewhere between the original recording of the scenes and the video's posting, a government agent or supernatural force who affects the footage in a horrifying way. It's through this effect that we typically get our true moments of horror. Quite like the camera work in Skinamarink, there's a trend in analog horror to avoid showing the action as it actually occurs. Often, the most unsettling imagery appears as photos, often doctored, that refer to events that have occurred before anyone could see them. A much better creator than me by the name of Wendigoon recently made a video comparing two well-known pieces of analog horror, Greylock and Urban Spook. It's a great video, I really recommend it, but there's a specific point Wendigoon makes that I want to focus on. While reviewing Urban Spook, Wendigoon points out that the series has very evocative art, but that the art falls flat because it's lacking in subtlety. He goes on to explain that the majority of the unsettling imagery in a horror story like Mandela Catalog, another very popular analog horror series, is only representative. The third party we mentioned earlier goes in and edits the footage to reference supernatural forces not depicted in the original work, and so we as the audience know that the terrible thing we're seeing is only an interpretation of a real idea. Therefore, we get a spooky face, but also an empty space space that our mind fills with its interpretation of what that spooky face might actually look like. However, in Urban Spook's case, the art is meant to act as the actual images of the antagonist. To Wendigoon, it's just a spooky face without any room for imagination. The issue is that, while Mandela Catalog and Greylock stay focused on the corner itself, Urban Spook guns it around the corner to show you, suffering children? I thought we already went over this. Unfortunately, Urban Spook falls right into the process of thought we were talking about earlier, that showing children suffering makes for good horror. Apparently some people are willing to stomach it, but it comes across as tasteless. To return to Mandela Catalog though, there's plenty more instances of the creator leaving room for you to make yourself squirm. There's almost no music at any point, and many scenes are left quiet and still, allowing you to really consider what you might do if something like this happened to you. Simple graphics representing incredibly intense situations have this unsettling aura, like a reminder of the first time you went through a lockdown drill. There's a clear sense of danger in the story, a world that is presented to you as though you are in it. I love a story that includes its audience as a character, that acknowledges itself as a work that's being viewed by an individual and speaks directly to that individual. It's almost a break of the fourth wall, but feels more like building a bigger room that fits the audience inside the fourth wall. It's not that reality is being broken to speak to you, it's that reality is being shifted so you're just as much a part of it as any character. It makes the story a character, it's interesting. Petscop does this in a great way. The first video, just called Petscop, is a guy making a YouTube video playing a game he found. He's not making it for us, really. He says, This is just to um, prove to you but I'm not lying about this game that I found. Implying a prior conversation and pretty quickly establishing that this video was meant for one specific person. Our watching of this video is just a byproduct of it being public on YouTube, and he acknowledges that it is on YouTube. 
We are at the same time included in the story, accepting that Paul, the speaker, is a person in reality and not a character in fiction, and that everything he's recording is his real findings, and yet simultaneously, we're held at a distance by the knowledge that this is not for us, and that likely, we'll not understand every reference made by Paul, due to his references being aimed towards a yet unnamed person. It's a great hook, and it happens in the first 40 seconds of the first video. I really don't think I have to cover Petscop's story for one thing, like any good analog horror, it's very convoluted and some elements are still up for debate, but also it's been out since 2017 and has been covered by a lot of different creators who are more suited towards that type of analysis, so instead of focusing on the story, I'll just talk broadly about why Petscop is so striking. The design of the overworld of Petscop is equally nostalgic and off-putting. There is a bright and happy color palette and a simple enough puzzle-based Pokemon-esque gameplay loop and yet things feel very empty. The game feels unfinished, the character designs are odd and imperfect. The empty white spaces that make up the background, the two-dimensional characters in the three-dimensional world, it's all very nostalgic of an old DS or Wii game, but at the same time, it doesn't have that sheen of perfection that Nintendo is known for. I want to describe it as discordant, but I don't know if that's the right word, it's, it's just off. And of course, what lurks beneath it isn't much better. The gritty texture on everything, the darkness which swallows up the setting, the distinct lack of music, it feels like Silent Hill, but Silent Hill didn't hide in a copy of Nintendogs. What is this doing beneath the innocuous pet game that Petscop claims to be? Skinamarink forces you to watch the children as an adult, hopefully, but Petscop challenges you to remember what it was like to be a kid playing a game late at night on an older gaming device. It asks you to remember the first time you played Majora's Mask and felt weird watching Link scream in agony as he transformed, the first time that you went to Lavender Town and heard that theme, the first time you heard cave sounds deep underground in Minecraft. It asks you to remember all the times something struck a nerve and made you wonder, what if there was more to this? What if there actually was something sinister beneath the surface? And after you remember that question, it answers you. It tells you, this is a game, one that's real and exists somewhere, and there is something sinister beneath the surface. And then it asks you to find out what that is. Isn't that good? Isn't that better than a loud bang and a demon popping up? I don't think there's a single real jump scare in all of Petscop, and yet it's some of the best horror I've seen. There's a running theme throughout all of these horror examples that really stands out, and I think it's just respecting your audience and your vision. You have to trust that your audience is capable of engaging with your work intelligently, and also trust that your work is solid enough that you don't need to force a cheap jump scare into it to make it scary. If you don't believe in either of these things while creating your work, you're destined to fail. What do all these projects really have in common? They're all products of passion. The effort and the heart that go into every single one of the horror projects I've mentioned is palpable, and they're not the only ones. They're just the ones that fulfill the little kid part in my brain that still hates loud noises. What makes good quiet horror? A couple of things. An engaging story, a distinct lack of noise, and room for your imagination. But what makes a good horror? A good creator.